So we are looking back at the same picture, particle in a box, but so we were, before we were approaching it intuitively, and we are going to get the same result, but this time using this uh, fundamental, you know, sort of Newton's second law of quantum mechanics. So, um, and you will see why I said this is the simplest possible, um, possible quantum mechanical scenario. So let me write down the Schrodinger equation, but modify, well, apply it to this specific situation. Schrodinger equation. So I guess I can start out with um, the full expression, and then I will cancel out whatever happens to be zero or whatever. So Schrodinger, full Schrodinger equation is this, minus h bar squared over 2m, double position derivative of this function, plus vx psi x is equal to i h bar single time derivative of psi. Right, that's the Schrodinger equation. Now, so this uh, thing that I drew in blue, this represents, this is my V as a function of position. That's why I drew it, because I knew I would need it later. Um, does this V have a convenient, um, kind of an analytically nice expression for this V of X? Like if I told you to um, express this position as a, oh sorry, not position, this potential energy as a function of position, how would you have to express it? No, I'm not doing Dirac delta function. In fact, after today, I won't even mention Dirac delta function because it's not a real function and it's an upper division material. But like, how would you, if, we, if somebody told you, you know, write down a mathematical equation for V of X, how would you do that? Let me ask you this question. If I said V of X is equal to zero, am I right? Am I entirely wrong? Okay, how am I partially right? It's only zero in between. All right, so I, yeah, so I can say it's a zero for x between zero and L. All right, so I know V for one regional space. Uh, how do I describe V here or here? What is the value of potential energy on, at this point? beyond the x equals zero. Somebody said infinity, right? Okay, yeah, infinity. So for x less than zero, it's going to be infinity, or I can say it approaches infinity. What about x greater than l? Also infinity or approaches infinity. I don't know, I have trouble saying something is equal to infinity. So this is how you have to describe your potential energy. You have to, this is a, I mean, you're using piecewise function, right? Well, that's the only way you can describe the potential function because it's a piecewise function. It actually has discontinuities. It's a zero from here to here, and at x equals zero, it discontinuously jumps to some value. So it's, you know, physically kind of artificial. That's why I was saying, you know, infinite electric field because that's the only way you can get a discontinuous electric potential. Uh, so it's a bit artificial, not really physically, but you know, we are using this as a model. Now, recognizing that this potential is a piecewise function kind of gives you an approach to how you should write down Schrodinger equation. Um, and so for this particular case, this doesn't end up mattering too much, but it is going to for a different example we'll look at later. So the approach we should take, we should take this entire space and divide it onto regions. Regions one, two, and three. It's kind of something you have been doing since physics 4A. When you have something happening discontinuously, like in a kinematics problem, acceleration suddenly changing from one constant value to another constant value, then you, you know, break it up into parts and do it in parts, right? It's the same thing here. I broke up it into regions, and you can write down Schrodinger equation for this region, 
Schrodinger equation for this region, Schrodinger equation for this region, right? Now, this is what I want you to imagine. We are not, I'm not actually going to write it down, but just imagine. Uh, do, you en do you envision any problem imagining writing down Schrodinger equation for region one? Like, will any of these terms give you a problem? You have infinite potential. So that means you have infinite term here. Um, so this is where, this is actually the justification for saying that psi at x less than zero is absolutely equal to zero. Because if I have something that's approaching infinity and something that's a zero, I can say that's a zero. Zero times whatever is arbitrarily large is still zero. <laughs> so in this region, that, that's where, so you know, before, we are, when we are going through intuitively, we just say intuitively it should be zero here. Now we, are, we have a mathematical justification. The only way Schrodinger equation can come out reasonably with this infinite potential is if we say um, the wave function here is zero. That's the only allowed value of wave function. And with that, the Schrodinger equation kind of becomes silly. It just says zero is equal to zero. Yeah, I guess that is correct, zero is equal to zero, but we don't really need to write that down to know that. But the same thing happens in this region, right? So psi of x greater than L, this also has to be zero. Right? This potential in this region is zero. I mean, sorry, potential is infinite. So I really want this term not to explode on me. So the only way to make sure that this term won't explode on me is to kill it with a zero. So this is actually why um, this is kind of a nice, simple picture for quantum mechanics. Because we can say that for this infinite region of space, infinite region of space, we don't have to do any kind of solution or solving anything because it's just going to be zero. Wave function will be zero. We only have to describe the wave function within this limited space. So that makes things kind of easy for us. We just have to, whatever expression come up with, whatever solution we come up with, we just have to make sure that it works in this limited space. Okay, so really the one region that where we actually need to describe stuff is region two. So let's try to write down Schrodinger equation for this region too. So let me do that here. I need a little more space. Um, I think you guys all know what V of x is now. So um, um, Schrodinger equation. So I'm going to use subscript two as a reminder that this is uh, the subset of this equation that only applies to this region. So minus h bar squared over 2m. I guess these are all constants. I'm not going to change any of this. Partial derivative of the Schrodinger, uh, the wave function in region two with respect to x plus, what is this in region two? Zero. Yeah, zero. This time for a different reason. The, this time the potential is zero. The wave function is you know, hopefully not zero. Um, so in other way, the term itself is zero. That's equal to i h bar partial derivative of the wave function in region two with respect to time t. So this is the Schrodinger equation in, um, in our, um, uh, in this region. Mm. And um, I can actually tell you what the solution to this is. And this is kind of a dirty trick that it's so very common with the physics. Is, so have you seen a differential equation that looks like this before? If you're thinking wave equation, this is not exactly it. Because it's a double position derivative equal to a single time derivative. So you haven't really seen it, right? So, um, so this is a new differential equation that uh, most people here haven't seen before, haven't solved before, haven't you know, pretended to solve it before. 
right? And um, the truth here is that even as much as I pretend that MATH3F is a core requisite for this class, it's not. And even if it were core requisite, um, like that doesn't mean you passed it. <laughs> you might have, you know, enrolled in it and then decided to drop out of MATH3F, right? <laughs> so um, in this class, we are not really going to, like the moment I start saying inhomogeneous uh, linear equation, I'm doing something wrong. Um, so we are solving differential equation, but solving in the sense that physicists do it. We're just guessing a solution to it, and the solution we guess just conveniently happens to work. <laughs> so let me tell you the dirty trick in physics. We have a very convenient guess. We are going to guess every single time as a solution to a differential equation. Doesn't mean it always works, but it works like more than half the time, even in upper division. This is our universal guess for differential equations. Our universal guess is um, of, of the wave solution. It's actually, it kind of takes form of the plane wave. So wave of xt, um, the, like as a function of position and time, is some kind of complex exponential. That's our guess. And um, I guess um, this combination here, the combination that goes in here is the function of position and time. And you know, it's a function going into complex exponential. Might as well form it in the form kx minus omega t. So that's our guess. Let's see if this actually is a solution to this. It might be, might not be. That's the whole idea of guessing. We don't know if it is, but this is so often actually the solution. It might be. So let me give it a try, and you know, whatever we get, we get. Um, everyone good with that? OK. So let me plug it in, see what I get on the left-hand side. I get um, so minus h bar squared over 2m, minus h bar squared over 2m. Um, so uh, let me write it down. So this is our guess. And this is our um, record of the trial, how the guess works out. So double position derivative. This is sort of why we are guessing on exponential. It makes our calculus super easy. We don't have to do anything. Uh, all we have to do is pretend to apply chain rule, by which I mean these factors come out. So the double position derivative, it really means taking out this factor of i, k, once, twice, now I'm done. Okay. All right. Um, and then I still have the original function left, so let me write that down. Psi of xt. Okay. Plus um, 0 is equal to the right hand side. Um, I h bar. Um, Hmm. Uh, okay, okay, I'm not going to run into trouble, I hope. Um, so single time derivative of this, once again, the exponential makes calculus easy, nothing changes here, all I get is this factor to come out. So minus i h, not h bar, minus i omega, and then I get the same function back again. So psi of x t. Um, all right, so uh, I see something that's promising. This is the nice thing about guessing on exponential. The functions are kind of guaranteed to cancel out each time because none of the derivatives you did changed anything. Right? So all I get are these coefficients that remain, which are um, minus, um, so i squared is minus 1. So minus 1 times minus 1 plus 1 h bar squared k squared over 2n is equal to um, i times minus i is 1, so h bar omega. Does this sound reasonable? Like that this combination of coefficients, quantities, wave number, should we call this combination of h bar and omega? Mm. Let me uh, rewrite this in a way to convince you. 
h bar times k, uh, I guess I erased it, that was uh, h over lambda, right? So h over lambda, that's my momentum p. So, um, so the left-hand side, all that's saying is momentum squared over 2m. And the right-hand side is, that's the same, that's equal to e, a or h times f. So kinetic energy is equal to energy. It's almost a kind of circular argument because like, I knew that was the case. Um, so I guess um, now something should be a, sound a little bit off in your intuition. If I'm simply telling you that, yes, this gas is actually the solution to this differential equation. But do you feel like uh, plane waves should represent what's going on in here? No, right? I mean, I have this barrier. Where is plane wave coming from? But like, I have this barrier. Where is plane wave going to? So, um, so what this is, is this is a, you know, I'm going to forget all the mathematical terms. It's kind of a solution, but you need to restrict it. So here's one way in which this is nothing like the solution that we are expecting it to be. So those, whatever solution that we are expecting here, we kind of want, this is what we want. We want psi at x equals 0 at any time. We want this to be equal to 0, right? Now, when you look at this, you're not going to get that. Because um, you plug in x equals 0, you get psi of xt is equal to a times exponential of minus i omega t, meaning at different times, it's not going to be 0. It's going to be something else. Um, and the same, you get the same problem at this end, um, right? So, so this uh, technically satisfies dif this differential equation, but what it does not satisfy is, uh, we call this boundary condition. It's kind of what it sounds like. Um, this is a boundary, and I was saying that this is a condition that needs to be met at the boundary. We call it boundary condition. <laughs> so this is a general solution, which uh, could kind of work as overall thing. But um, I need to find a specific case that, um, that satisfies um, this boundary condition. And now here's a bit of a difficulty here. So if you try to fit this to that boundary condition, you know, you say, all right, so at x equals 0, you want to impose this to be equal to 0. Um, it actually doesn't work. Because um, if we want this entire expression to be equal to 0, the only way that will happen is if a is equal to 0, which means I don't have a wave. right? So this is where I have to tell you a bit of a, um, well, one nice uh, mathematical factoid to, to know about differential equations, especially linear, um, is it homogeneous? <laughs> differential equations, uh, linear differential equations. And, um, and two, something to be aware of these plane wave solutions. Especially in quantum mechanics, these plane wave solutions, they are always going to be unphysical. They will never represent something that is a physically existing thing. That's the nice thing about this particle in a wave. It represents some, you can, something you can Im easily imagine e existing physically. This plane wave, if you do it properly, what we would represent is it would represent this particle spread out all space and time, all space. Like that's, I mean, maybe that can happen, but that's so, you know, unimaginably unphysical. That's what plane wave will always represent. So you need to be kind of wary of plane waves when you are dealing with quantum mechanics. But it can be a basis of how we build up our solution. So this is the factoid that's useful to know about differential equations. So this is a differential equation, right? 
suppose you have two solutions. Let's say psi 1 and psi 2. Let's say they are both the solutions to this differential equation. Um, from your math classes, do you know if their sum is also a solution? We only know it for ordinary differential equation. But is it also true for partial? Uh, we'll say this is well behaved enough that it's going to work. It's also another common assumption in physics that we are going to assume all our functions are well behaved. There's no um, pathologies in those functions. <laughs> I don't know if it holds for partial differential equations in general. It holds for hours. <laughs> Good. So, uh, so the phrase is any linear combination of these, meaning it can be a scalar coefficient, another scalar coefficient. This is also a solution to the same differential equation. And you can, you know, if you kind of go through it, you can see, you know, each of these derivatives, you know, it's split, you distribute it between these terms, and you know, each of these terms are going to match the corresponding term on the other side, so it's going to work out. So that's the fact we are going to use. So I have this this solution, in um, so the, this traveling wave solution that is a solution, and I have a sense that the kind of the solution that I want here is the standing wave solution, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use two traveling wave solutions to build me a standing wave solution. So, so this was my guess number one. That didn't really work out. Even though all this worked out, when I started the checking boundary condition, it didn't work. So now I move on to my guess number two, which is based on this. So my guess number two is this. Um, so let me move on to guess number two. My guess number two, oops, two, two <laughs> is, um, so I'm going to use this as one of my guesses. So this is the rightward traveling wave, right? I'm going to add it to leftward traveling wave. So say, all right, now this time my guess for psi in region two is this, a exponential of i kx minus omega t plus add it to a, a wave that's traveling the other way of the same amplitude, a times e to the uh, so if it's going the other way, it must be, I um, guess I can do it two different ways. I, which one do I prefer? Uh, I, I do prefer this, uh, minus kx minus omega t. Does everyone see that this wave is traveling to the left in the negative x direction? Yes. This is how you see it here. The way you see that this wave is traveling to the right is imagine what you need to do to x so that as you increase t, as time passes, um, if uh, you have to move the point to the right or move it to the left to keep up with the same point on the wave. As t increases, x has to increase with it to keep on the same point on the wave. Here, you have to do the opposite. As t increases, x has to decrease so that this, uh, this phase parameter doesn't change, meaning you are on the same point on the wave. Yeah. So all right, so that's our second guess. And um, I guess before I plug it into here, actually, um, OK, I don't need to plug it in here, because from this, I know that is a solution to this. Right? Now, what I need to kind of be sure of is that when I check the boundary condition, that it'll work. right? Let me do a little bit of pre-simplification so that it's easier for us to see this. Um, I'm going to, uh, so I'm just go through a series of algebraic steps, follow it, and make sure it actually makes sense that I didn't make any mistakes, and, um, and then we will deal with the end result. I'm going to factor out A. So I have A times, I'm going to write this out e to the i k x, multiply it with, e to the minus i omega t plus, uh, I factored out a, so it's uh, e to the minus i k x times e to the minus i omega t 
right? I see something else I can factor out. e to the minus i omega t. So I have a times e to the i kx plus e to the minus i kx times e to the minus i omega t. Um, does this look familiar to any people? Oh, I messed up. Did I mess up? Mm. I kind of messed up, which I'll need to fix later. Um, I, I will go back and fix it later. <laughs> um, oh. um, so what does this look like? It looks like a cosine of kx, all right. So it's going to be, it's actually 2 cosine of kx. So it's 2a times cosine of kx times e to the minus i omega t. So this is where I'm recognizing that I messed up because um, at x equals 0, I want my wave function to be 0. But if this is cosine, this is 1 instead of 0. So I actually wanted a sign here. So I'm looking back here. If this was minus instead of plus, then I would have sine, right? Or something that's related to a sine. So for this to be minus, this should be minus. So this should be minus. And uh, like this plus being minus is actually no problem in terms of our guess, right? We could have guessed the you know psi one minus the psi two. So let me fix that. So this is minus, <laughs> meaning this is minus meaning this is minus. So instead of having, um, co so this is actually um, two, so I'm, let me just write it down so that I'm sure I memorized the formula correctly. Um, e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta, um, that should be equal to, That should be equal to 2i times sine of theta. Right? Because this is the formula I'm remembering. Sine of theta can be expressed as e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over 2i. And when you expand this out using Euler's formula, twice cancels out whatever's at the top, and you get sine theta. Right? OK. So, this here is equal to 2i sine theta. So you have 2i times a sine kx. So this is a solution that will now meet our criteria. So this meets the boundary condition here. When you plug in x equals 0, when you plug in x equals 0 here, sine of kx is 0. So no matter what these are, it will be 0. Good. Now, we have boundary condition at the other end. We have this condition, the psi of x equals l. It should also be equal to 0 at all uh, time, at all moments in time. So what? The other thing we need is, um, so let me just write down the equation and see if there's a condition we can impose. If we write that down, psi of 2, um, x equals L, t, we want this to be equal to 0. Then you know, plugging in x equals L, then what we have is 2i times a times sine of Lx times e to the i minus i omega t. So what this condition means is that, well, this is the only free parameter I have. So this must be equal to 0. So I guess um, l times x must be a multiple of pi, I think, n pi, right? If it's 0 pi, and then 0 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, it's going to be 0, right? OK, so um, wait, wait, sorry, I plugged it in wrong, sorry, um, not L. Um, <laughs> sorry, it should have been KL. 
sorry, I don't know why. I plugged in L for K, not L for X. So plugging in L for X, it's KL. So what that means is, sorry, uh, messed up here. So K times L is equal to N pi. And remember that uh, K is lambda over 2 pi. So this left-hand side is really lambda times L over 2 pi. And you get that, all right, let's solve it for um, lambda. When you solve it for lambda, you get, wait, I messed up something. K is not lambda over 2 pi, K is 2 pi over lambda. Why aren't people correcting me? <laughs> okay, so K is 2 pi over lambda, right? Okay, so 2 pi over lambda. So when you solve for lambda, move lambda over there, move n pi over here, pi's cancel out, so you get 2. So you end up with lambda is equal to 2 pi L divided by n pi, or 2 L over n, which is the result we had before. So this result we had before, that there is only a limited number of, limited kinds of wavelengths that are allowed. We get that result by applying this boundary condition to the solution to the Schrodinger equation. So all these results that we can intuitively get said, you can also derive them mathematically rigorously once you have Schrodinger equation. So you know, for this, um, for this particle in a box, particle in an infinite walled box, all this kind of looks, um, so all this machinery we are using seems um, excessive. Right? Like, why were we doing that? We had the answer like two hours ago. <laughs> two hours later, we don't have anything better. We're just reconfirming the same answer. Um, it's because, you know, it's like what we are doing here, it's like, a, um, it's like a small screwdriver. And this is power tool. And there are tasks that that small screwdriver will do that power tools can also do. But there are tasks that require power tool. So um, probably not today. I only have 12 minutes left. Um, another set of quantum mechanical problems that I think are solvable at our level is what's called a finite square well. This is a more physically reasonable version of the infinite square well. So here we said the potential goes to infinity. What if the potential doesn't go to infinity? Instead, potential tops out here, and then it, then it becomes flat. Potential tops out here, then it becomes flat. So this is something that's physically reasonable. In, okay, so you have discontinuity in the potential, but um, like you can have that potential wall. Um, and to analyze this, our intuitive approach won't work anymore because th there's some probability that particle will be here, even if uh, it doesn't have enough energy to actually present here. We'll talk about that later. Um, so. That's where you do need a Schrodinger equation. Because you need to, so one of the form of the solution that'll look like is something that looks like this, for example. And we need, it's a continuous function. And we need a set of differential equations that will describe this continuous function, continuous smooth function. So, so we'll get to that sometime soon. I'm not sure exactly when. Um, but that's the reason we have this Schrodinger equation. And, and in this semester, we won't use it as much. That's because it does involve a lot of difficult calculus and algebra. A lot of that is left to um, your upper division quantum mechanics.